Thank you, thank you. Uh, so my name is Dave Gilbert, and I've been working here at the museum for uh, over 30 years. So I know a lot about Dansville history, and Clara Barton was always a big part of that history. Here's why she's important in one sentence. Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross. I'm sure you know what some of the things the American Red Cross does, right? They hold their blood drives. They help people who are victims of disasters. You know, if someone's house burned down or if there's a flood or a fire or some other terrible thing, here comes the Red Cross to, uh, to give them assistance. And here in America, it was Clara Barton, this lady right here, who uh, got the ball rolling. Um, now, why, does Claire, why is Clara Barton important to Dansville? Why does you guys know this one? Why? Why is she important to Dansville? Why, why is Dansville celebrating Clara Barton instead of Wayland or Mount Morris or Livonia or whatever? Where did she start the Red Cross? She started the Red Cross. Right here. Uh, Claire Barton lived here for 10 years, and while she was here, she, uh, she founded the American Red Cross. That's why we have that big statue over by the two churches that was just unveiled this past weekend. Claire Barton came to Danzel in 1876. She was in her 50s. So obviously, she, a lot went on in her life before she came to Danzel, and I'm going to very quickly uh, give you a a brief history of her first half century. I'm going to refer to my notes here, so I'm going to be doing this a lot. Um, she was born on Christmas Day, 1821, in Massachusetts. Uh, she had four older siblings, and when I mean older, they, I mean at least 10 years older. So basically, she grew up as the only child in a house full of adults. So, you know, the adults were doing the responsible adult things, and Clara Barton wanted to be a responsible person too. Uh, one, one, one of her brothers had an accident. Little Clara helped to uh, take care of him. And uh, that gave her her first uh, taste of helping other people. And it was something she would be doing throughout the whole rest of her life. In 1854, she would have been in her uh, early 30s by then, she got a job which doesn't sound like a big deal, but back then, unmarried women didn't go get jobs. They went looking for husbands or something like that. Uh, back in the 1800s, uh, independent women, there weren't too many of them. People looked at them like, well, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have a husband? But she, uh, she felt the need to uh, help others. <coughs> Uh, her first job was actually with a patent office in Washington, D.C. That's where inventors would go to, uh, to get their inventions uh, patented so they could sell them and get rich. So, uh, so not only did she get a job, she got a government job, which was even more unusual. So she was in Washington doing her patent office job when the Civil War broke out. And a lot of the Civil War took place not all that far from Washington, D.C. I don't have a map here to show you the geography, but a lot of the battles during the Civil War happened like less than 50 or 100 miles away from the capital, so it wasn't that far away. One of the regiments from her state was attacked by rioters. Not everyone was in favor of the war, and they took away a lot of their supplies, their, their food and uh, their blankets and their candles. So <coughs> she organized a drive to replace the stuff that they lost. So once she got started on this, she uh, kept ramping it up. She turned her house into a warehouse. And so not only did she supply that company, she supplied any soldiers who needed something. She actually went to the battlefields. Uh, August 1862, uh, at the Battle of Cedar Mountain, she went to where the troops actually were fighting and she uh, handed out food and clothing uh, and helped doctors. Now, she wasn't a ner trained nurse, but they'd take any help they could get. And she helped a lot. Um, she went from one battlefield to another. Also importantly, um, she didn't only just help the soldiers who were wearing Union uniforms. If there was injured Confederates too, she said, I don't care what uniforms they're wearing. We're going to give these people some help. So after the war ended, she... Uh, decided to go on a speaking tour to uh, 
travel the country and tell them about their ex her experiences in the war. She was trying to raise money to help locate missing soldiers. And in 1866, uh, she came to Dansville for the first time. Her first trip to Dansville was not the greatest experience. Um, Dansville didn't have a railroad. I think this is way before cars, of course. Um, so she had to take the railroad to Wayland. And then from Wayland, she had to get on a stagecoach and come down the hill to Danzo to give her speak. Well, wouldn't you know it, stage broke down. And uh, so she had to walk the last mile into Dansville. Um, and it was in the dark and it was December. So that's not the most promising beginning to her experience in Danzville. She gave her talk. She met a couple people who, as it, it turned out, would be important to her farther down the road. And then the next day she went back up to Whalen and continued on with her speaking tour. Now that speaking tour took a couple of years. She stopped at like 200 different places all around the, mostly the Northeast or the Ohio Valley. But that's an awful lot of time on the road going from one hotel to the next speaking, getting on the train, getting off speaking, getting on the train, getting off speaking. And she did that for two years. Uh, she pooped herself out, basically. She collapsed right in the middle of one of her talks. She, uh, she had worked herself to exhaustion and it took her a long time to get her health back. Um, Clara Barton wasn't very good at pacing herself. You know, she would work and work and work and work until she dropped, in this case, literally. And then she'd have to spend a long time getting her health back. Uh, eventually, she decided to go to uh, Europe with her sister to, uh, you know, rest and relax. But that's not what happened. When she got to Europe, she learned about this organization that they'd founded in Switzerland. It was called the International... What was it called, girls? What did she find? The International Red Cross. Red Cross. Yeah. yeah, there was a Red Cross in Europe before there was one in the U.S. So this would have been the late 1860s. Uh, she found out about this organization. The Red Cross had been founded in Switzerland. Now, if you've ever, if you've ever seen the, the flag of Switzerland, it is a white cross against a red background. So what the Red Cross was, did was they reversed the colors. Instead of a white cross and a red background, you have a red cross and a white background, which I think is pretty clever. That red cross soon became famous as, okay, these people are here to help. You know, don't shoot at them. Now, the thing about the red cross is they help soldiers, but they also helped um, civilians. Because, you know, war can be pretty hard on civilians, especially if the battle's like over on the other side of town. So they needed help too. And so she started working with the International Red Cross and the more she did, the more she thought, you know what, the U.S. should have something like this too. And so she was determined to, uh, to bring that idea across the ocean back to the U.S. And she hoped that the United States would join the International Red Cross. But once again, just like she'd done on that speaking tour, she worked herself too hard. And by the time she got back to the U.S., she was even worse shape than she was when she left. She, she'd gone over there to relax, and instead she worked herself half to death again. And this time it was a long, long time recovering. In fact, she wasn't really sure if she was ever going to recover. That's how bad off she was. And she was in her early 50s. But then she remembered this place called Dansville. And Dansville had a place where people could go to get healthy again. And that place was called Our Home on the Hillside. And if you look down here against the wall, you can see a, an illustration of what it looked like. Now, you look up on the hill right now, you see what? You see a great big brick building. When she came to town, that brick building hadn't been built yet and said there was that. I have little uh, bits of stationery here that show that picture and I'm going to pass them out for your uh, 
for your official souvenir. So the man who was running the uh, our home on the hillside was uh, Santa Claus here. His name was Dr. James Caleb Jackson. Oh, Jackson, it's the Jackson Sanatorium. He came to Dansville in the 1850s. This was about a dozen years before Clara Barton made her um, made her first visit here. Uh, and he was a he was a health enthusiast. His mission in life was to. Uh, make sick people healthier and to make sure that people who are healthy stay healthy. His idea was number one, eat the right foods. Um, and that would be, what, what, they, what do they say the right foods to eat are these days? Salads, yeah. fruits, fruits, yeah. fruits, yep, that's, that's exactly what he told people. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Don't eat so much meat. Uh, drink plenty of water. In fact, up on the hill, they have a spring, which they call the All Healing Spring, because it was supposed to keep you nice and healthy. In fact, that's why our home on the hillside was built, because they had a spring that was just kind of running out from the hill. And so people were encouraged to drink lots of water. They'd also like uh, do a lot of bathing and a lot of uh, wet, wrapping themselves in wet sheets, because all all that clean water is supposed to be good for you and really they weren't wrong so plenty of fruits vegetables also uh, whole grain foods like bran muffins and uh, oatmeal and uh, uh, graham crackers in fact over here again going back to this cabinet there's this odd uh, little round lump and when you get a chance to come over and look at it uh, that's a graham cracker <laughs> Somebody, somebody kept it as a souvenir back in the 1860s, and there it is still, you know, over 150 years later. It's probably pretty rock hard right now. I, I mean, I wouldn't call it food now because it's, you know, it's, old, it's older than this house. The other thing that Dr. Jackson did was he, uh, he took his kind of a graham cracker thing, tweaked the recipe a little bit, and crumpled it up into little gravelly bits. You guys ever eaten grape nuts? No. In, the, in in a little box, they 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 look they. Grape nuts are delicious. Grape, okay, she she knows. It's a cereal, it's it's cereal. Nuts. Yeah. and so good. He called his cereal granula, and they used to sell it in. Uh, again, if you look over here in the bottom, you can see that little yellow tin thing. That's what they uh, that's what they sold granula in. Granula was the first cold breakfast cereal. So anytime you pour yourself a bowl of Cheerios or Fruit Loops or Cocoa Pebbles or whatever, uh, it all started down there with granola. He wasn't a big fan of sugar, so he probably wouldn't have been cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But um, eventually others would you know, follow his cue and then we'd get Corn Flakes and Shredded Wheat and, uh, and eventually Cheerios and so on and so forth. But granola was the first, he was the inventor. So he's kind of an important guy in his own right. Another friend that um, Clara Barton made when she was in dance school uh, was a doctor named Harriet Austin. If, and if you crane your necks over and see that picture underneath the speaker of the uh, woman who's dressed in kind of a vesty skirt trousers thing, that's Harriet Austin. And Harriet Austin, along with all the other things Dr. Jackson um, recommended, I was also big on dress reform. If you've ever seen old shows like uh, Little House on the Prairie or Dr. Quinn or even, even Cinderella where they were all wearing these dresses that go all the way down to the ground. Uh, that's what women wore and they wore them all year long. No shorts, no yoga pants or anything like that. It was, it was layers and layers and, and it wasn't just the outer dress, they're like seven or eight layers of, of undergarments to go along with them. Back in those days, ladies weren't allowed to show their legs. Like, ah! Yeah, that... So, yeah, she, she wanted those skirts brought up off the ground, but she didn't want people to uh, go, oh! Uh, so she came up with this thing called the American costume, which is uh, basically trouser legs with a shorter skirt worn over them. Now, people still went, ah, because they weren't used to that. She tried to get anyone who came to uh, Dan, any of the ladies who came to Danzo to wear the American costume. And, and here's a book on the castle. And uh, here's some pictures, which I will show you, of vari variations on the American costume. 
Again, you've got a skirt going right around to the knee and then underneath trouser legs. So they had all different kinds of uh, variations. You didn't just wear the same thing every time. She tried to get Clara Barton to wear them. Clara Barton tried for a while, but she didn't much care for it, so she went back to the dress. But they became really good friends. She was probably Clara Barton's best friend when she was in Danville. So Clara Barton came. They gave her advice on how to eat, how to, uh, what to eat, what to drink. Um, even more importantly, how to relax. Because Clara Barton wasn't very good at that. She always needed to... <laughs> but they said, no, no, relax. Have a seat. Just, you know, enjoy the fresh air. Don't, don't even write letters to people because people did that all the time back then. And so just, let's have some me time. So she, she'd, take, she'd take her meals up at the castle. Eventually she would uh, settle into a house. And uh, this is it, it's not around anymore. But if you drove up Perrine Street when you got to the very top, that would be the house that faced you. So she lived in this for most of her 10 years in Dansville. She still went up to the, uh, our home on the hillside to take her meals. And then she'd come down here and she'd you know, sit in a rocking chair, pet her cat, um, and just chill. And she did that for about a year because that's how long she needed to get her health back. Once she did get her health back, then you know, with the okay of her doctor friends, then she got back to work on that big mission of getting America interested in the Red Cross. So she started to make train trips back down to Washington, D.C. She had another residence there. And she tried to get the government interested in, uh, in the U.S. joining the International Red Cross. It was not easy to do. It took her five years of, of you know, trying to get her foot in the door and talk to people about the wonderful thing, wonderful things that the Red Cross was doing over in Europe. And uh, some people were like, what's this woman trying to tell me what to do? And just, just, you know, go away. Others were much more receptive. By, by the time she got back to work, a lot of uh, those Civil War soldiers were now working in Washington, and a lot of them were politicians, and they had some they had some clout and of course they knew Clara Barton from all the things she did in the war and they were willing to join her on this and eventually she got enough people not just uh, politicians but also uh, <laughs> preachers and philanthropists and businessmen and newspaper owners interested and even though she couldn't get the government to get on board the Red Cross she said okay fine I'll just make one on our own. So she and all her friends, and this was in 1881, they got together to form the American Red Cross. And so, you know, they, they made up their document, they signed their names, and there we go. You have Red Cross on a piece of paper. So what do you do next? Now you get everyone in America interested in joining the Red Cross. So you, they have to get down to the local level and start forming uh, little chapters of the Red Cross. And for her, the obvious first place to do that was Dansville. So she came back to Dansville a few weeks later um, in August 1881. Uh, she and a hundred other people met in the Lutheran Church, the white church over there in the corner. And they formed the Dansville Association of the Red Cross. And eventually there would be several and dozens and hundreds around the nation. But the first one was here in Dansville and Clara Barton helped to organize it. A couple weeks later, there was this terrible disaster, a forest fire in Michigan. Now, if, if you're up on your U.S. geography, you know that Michigan is like like a two-part state. There's the part that hangs overhead and then there's the part on the bottom that looks like a big mitten and like any big mitten there's a thumb. That's where the forest fire took place, in the thumb. And it was a huge forest fire. Imagine a fire that destroyed 
all of Livingston County and all of Monroe County where Rochester is and some more land besides. That's how big this forest fire was. Hundreds of people died. Thousands of people lost their homes. Thousands and thousands of buildings were lost. Entire villages were wiped out. It was terrible. Now here's the Red Cross. They were a couple of weeks old. They had like, you know, a hundred people in it. What could they do? Well, they could do what they could do. And so they got organized. They raised money. They gathered supplies. Like, you know, if you've lost everything, you need everything. You know, food, clothing. Uh, if you're a farmer, you're going to need seeds for when you were finally ready to replant your crops. Um, you know, furniture for your house, when you, when you get around to rebuilding your house. Uh, so they, they organized and they shipped things in boxes. Clara Barton went to Rochester and Syracuse and they shipped things in boxes too. And within a month, uh, these big crates with that Red Cross symbol on it started showing up in Michigan and to, to help all those victims of the fire. Now, people from all across the rest of the country helped, too. So, you know, the Red Cross's contribution wasn't huge because the Red Cross still wasn't huge, but it was a start. And when people saw what good the Red Cross was doing, they said, yeah, let's get on with that. So other villages and cities all across the country started forming their own chapters of the Red Cross. So each time another disaster showed up, the Red Cross could help more and more. And um, I think the next disaster was a, a flood down in the Mississippi River. And it, they just kept building it and building and the Red Cross got bigger and bigger. Today it's still the number one humanitarian organization in the US. And of course, Clara Barton was in the middle of it. And as the Red Cross kept getting bigger and bigger, she found herself needing to spend more and more time down in Washington, D.C. to help all the organization and stuff. So she'd be taking those train trips from Dansville to Washington, back to Dansville and so on. She worked hard, but thanks to the lessons she learned at our home on the hillside, she didn't work herself half to death. You know, she, she knew when to pace herself, finally. Meanwhile, stuff was happening here in Dansville that changed things. Um, Santa Claus and the lady in the strange skirt, they retired and they moved away from Danzel. Those were her two closest friends in Danzel. Now, James Caleb's son, James Jackson, and his wife, Kate Jackson, that's the big portrait up there, they took over the place. They were both doctors. Again, Harriet Austin and Kate Jackson were doc doctors. There weren't that many female doctors back then. There were very few of them. Then in 1882, that building burned up. Somebody tipped over a lamp in a bedroom and the fire spread. Uh, there were no fire hydrants back then. There was barely a fire department. And that was just all made of wood and it was, it was like a bonfire. Within hours, it was nothing left but a big pile of ashes. Uh, the best they could do was get everybody out, which they did, thank goodness. Nobody, nobody died or, or even got hurt much in that fire. But it was gone. James and Kate needed to decide, okay, so we're gonna move on or are we gonna rebuild? Well, they rebuilt. And they built that building that's up there now, the, uh, the one that used to look like this when it was still operating and everyone was, and they were taking care of the grounds and, and it was doing very well. Uh, it was first called the Jackson Sanatorium. It went by some other names over the years, but it kept going for another 80 years. So it was doing pretty good. Uh, but Clara Barton, she missed her old friends. She even missed the old building. You know, the new one was nice, but it wasn't the one she'd come to fall in love with. So in 1886, she made the hard decision. It's time to leave Dansville for good. And so in, the, uh, in, the, in March, I think, of 1886, she, uh, she gave her farewell address. You good people have given me my health back, was part of the speech she gave before she hopped on the train and left Dansville, never to return. So for the rest of her life, 
she would keep working with the Red Cross and do all kinds of other uh, good deeds. She was one of the, later in life, she came up with, uh, and her friends came up with the uh, first, first aid kit. You know, what, what, how do you, you know, teaching people first aid, you know, was important too. So they, that was another one of the things she helped the pioneer. Uh, so she, uh, she lived a long time, you know, back when she first came to Dansville, she wasn't sure if she was going to make it past the year, but she lived for another 36 years and passed away in 1912 at the age of 90. Oh, really old. Yeah. And, uh, and a few years later, the Red Cross chapter in Dansville renamed itself Clara Barton chapter number one. And so, you know, we recognize the important role that Clara Barton had in Dansville. Then they, in the 1950s, they renamed the street, Clara Barton Street. And uh, pretty soon, sometime over the summer, they're going to put up a mural over there on the corner of Main and Ocean that will also celebrate Clara Barton. And of course, this past weekend, they put up that wonderful bronze statue. When we celebrate the... Uh, <coughs> Clara Barton, it isn't just the fact that she lived here for 10 years, that'd be enough maybe, but that she made so much history while she was in Dansville. Because thanks to her, the Red Cross began here in Dansville. If you don't rem remember anything else from what I just said, remember that. Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross and it started here. Oh, there is one picture I didn't, I brought down to show you. Um, This picture was taken during a Jackson family get-together. And what we have here is a whole bunch of members of the Jackson family. Uh, let me see if I can find all the important people here. Uh, there's, there's James Caleb Jackson, the Santa Claus beard guy. <laughs> and there's his son, James H., that's him, looking up through this telescope that his son, James Arthur, got for his birthday. And Harriet Austin is, I'm trying to see which one is her. I think that's her right there. And right there is Clara Barton in the white bonnet and the black dress. It's one of the only pictures of Clara Barton that was ever taken here in Dansville.